This is Math 151, and we are talking about Section 2.4, Continuity. Uh, continuity as in continuous. So as you would think, continuous means no gaps, no jumps in it. Um, and we're talking about functions. Are functions continuous? Do they have continuity? Or at least where do they have continuity? A real informal definition of continuity is if I'm drawing, I don't have to lift up my pencil, right? So like this thing is continuous. Even if it's not a function, that's continuous. But as soon as I have to lift it up, I have a discontinuity there. Um, so again, one way to think about it is if you can leave your pencil down and draw the whole thing, it's continuous. So if I had a graph, uh, we've seen some graphs that look like this. This graph is not continuous at that point. <clears throat> we call it a uh, discontinuous or discontinuity at that point. Or if I have a graph that has an asymptote, like this, or like this, even if they both go to infinity, that asymptote is a discontinuity in that graph. Or if I have a jump, right? Like we've seen some stuff that looks like that as well. I had to make a jump in here. It's not continuous at that point. Now it doesn't have to be smooth. It can be jagged. Like if I have something that looks like this, this is continuous. It's just not smooth. There's some there's some implications about derivatives around those points, but it's still continuous because I didn't you know think about again. I didn't have to pick up my pencil uh, or my drawing tool, whatever that may be. So we could roughly think about um, continuity having kind of three requirements. Um, the functions defined at that point, the limit at that point exists, and the limit is equal to um, f of a, the function at that point. So basically, like if I look at this right here, f of a is defined, it has a point, the limit exists, but the limit does not equal the function at that point. So this would this would be discontinuous because of this third condition right here. Um, and again, if it's not, that's it's it's discontinuous, or it's called a discontinuity at that point. Every other place it's continuous. It's continuous here and it's continuous here. So I'm going to think about where they are continuous at. So one thing I notice is I'm trying to divide by zero here. So this has to have a discontinuity at x equals negative five. <clears throat> so if I, can if I want to describe where this is continuous, it's continuous from infinity up to negative five, and then from negative five out to positive infinity. So this is, um, this is set notation, the way that I'm writing it. And the, the open bracket, this is not a point. Um, a hard bracket means equal to, less than equal to, greater than equal to, and a soft bracket means strictly less than, strictly right than. Uh, so this would be like from infinity to negative five, and then from negative five to infinity. All right, so uh, let's look at this one. Where is it continuous? So this is a uh, compound function. We have some conditions. When x is less than or equal to two, this makes a parabola until x is greater than two, and then this makes a straight line. So, I mean, a rough drawing of it would be it's a straight line for a while, and then, I'm uh, sorry, it's a parabola for a while, and then it's a straight line. Now, if these hook up at the same spot, it's continuous there. If they don't, it's not continuous there. So let's plug it in. Let's, let's see what happens at those points. And I, I can just plug in to, to find those limits because, uh, I know that those are those functions on their own are continuous don't have any gaps so if i plug this in this would be uh two squared plus three four plus three is seven if i plug this in here two plus four two plus four is six now they, they go to different spots right so um the limit as this approaches two is seven the limit as this approaches two from the right is six so i'm going to say um discontinuous at x equals two. That's the spot where it's, it doesn't have. And let's check this last one then. Um, 5x over x if x is not equal to zero. 
Well, 5x over x is 5. So this thing is, is a flat line at 5, except when x is 0. And when x is 0, it tells me this thing equals 5. See how that closes the hole? Continuous. This is always continuous. So let's take a peek at this one. Where is this discontinuous? Well, I know I can't divide by 0. So that's one thing I'm going to keep track of. Um, dividing by 0 <laughs> is bad. It's impossible. Um, it's something that we can't do. So that's a condition I'll check for for discontinuity. And in this case, um, I am dividing by 0 when x equals 4. So x cannot equal 4. In other words, when x is 4, I have a discontinuity at that point. Okay, this cubic. Well, I know cubics look like that. And they go on forever in both sides. This is always continuous. No, no, no discontinuities. No discount. All right, this one. Well, okay. Taking the square root of a negative number. We actually, that's something that we can do, right? I mean, we, we know how to do that. We know that it gives us imaginary numbers. But when we graph... There's no imaginary numbers on this graph. These are This is all real numbers. All our x values are real. Our y values are real. So um, what we need to make sure is that this thing is non-negative. It can be 0. So we know that x minus 3 has to be greater than 0. So if I add 3 to both sides, um, actually, let's find or equal to. Yeah. Add 3 to both sides. So this is continuous as long as x is greater than or equal to 3. So I could say it's continuous on this interval, including 3, out to infinity. Now, there's a little technicality here. Um, you know, I know that this graph looks like, like this, where x is 3 right here. And I know that the right-hand limit exists, and the left-hand limit, as x approaches 3, actually doesn't exist. Um, so it, it feels like saying it's continuous at 3 violates this, but I, I left out uh, a little piece. It has to be over like the range of the definition of the operator. Y you know what I mean by that is like um, square root is defined as it, it's only going to take in positive values and it'll spit out val uh, it'll spit out values, positive values as well. Um, as a function if we stay over the reals. So even though this limit doesn't exist, this is, con um, even though this limit doesn't exist, this is continuous at that point. You can draw it the whole time. And it's because it's a function, it's a result of this function, the way that function is defined. So we're gonna define uh, three types of discontinuities. And we've already talked about one of them here. This is called a removable. You see how the point's just kind of removed from the line. Whoops, removable. Notice that violates this right here. Another type would be a jump. So we have this jump right here where the, the limits don't go to the same spot from both sides. And the third one that we'll uh, mention is this asymptotic type one where it is an infinite discontinuity. So in the homework, you're asked to uh, just like look at a graph and identify what type of discontinuity it is. So three different graphs, and I want to answer the question, where are they continuous? So let's start with this one. Let's do a little bit analysis of this one. There's no square root in it, but there is some division. So one thing I know is that when this equals 0, I have trouble. I'm dividing by 0. So let me see when that happens. Uh, factor out an x. x times x plus 2 is 0. So it looks like it happens when uh, x equals 0 and x equals negative 2. Now, since nothing cancels here, um, we know that those these are going to be infinite um, discontinuities, right? They're like where asymptotes happen. So negative 2. So 
if I th just think about just the axis, x-axis, at negative 2, there's going to be an asymptote. And at 0, there's going to be an asymptote. And there's going to be graph going on in between these. So where is this continuous? This is continuous from z uh, negative infinity to 2, uh, negative 2, in this region here. It's continuous from negative 2 to 0. And then it's continuous from 0 to infinity. And again, this is a set notation. This means the range from negative 2 to 0 exclusive, not including negative 2 and 0. Uh, let's look at h of x next. Square root going on. So I'm going to let that be greater than or equal to 0. It can be 0, but it can't be negative. It has to be non-negative. So this, when is this greater than or equal to 5? That's when this is continuous. Subtract 5. X is greater than or equal to negative 5. So the range is negative 5 inclusive forever out to infinity. And we, we, don't, we don't say, uh, we never say inclusive infinity because uh, that implies that infinity is a location. And it's, it's not. It's, it's just kind of a direction. Uh, last one, another square root one. So I know I want this thing to be positive. I know that I know 9 minus x squared. I want it to be greater than or equal to 0. So I'm going to add x squared to both sides. I'm going to square root both sides. And something happens to this inequality. And this becomes plus or minus 3. So x is somehow compared to plus or minus 3. So I've got negative 3, I've got positive 3. And then my question just becomes, where does this graph happen? Does it happen out here at all? Does it happen in here at all? Does it happen out here at all? I'll just test some regions. So let's say I plug in a negative 100. 9 minus negative 100 squared. That's going to be negative, square root of a negative. So I don't have any of the shape in here. Uh, if it's 0 clearly works in there. I've got some shape in here. And if it's uh, to the right of 3, like 100, 9 minus 100 squared is, is negative. So it doesn't happen out here either. So this graph happens between negative 3 and 3, inclusive, because they are they're actually part of it. I can plug the 3s in and get zeros. So this gives us what's called the intermediate value theorem. Um, and this is, this is pretty useful. And it relates um, kind of like our definition of limit did, outputs to inputs. So let's, let's, uh, let's plow through this language. F is a continuous, uh, F is continuous, it's a continuous function, over a bounded closed interval, AB. So let's, let's sketch what we have so far. So we have some boundary a to b and uh, we have some function we have no idea what it looks like uh, and we don't know this is for any function if z is between f of a and f of b so let's think about those values f of a would be here and f of b would be here. Okay, and so it says z is between f of a and f of b. So z is somewhere in this region right here. So that's all part of our conditional, right? If z is between f of a and f of b, then there has to exist a c such that c is in a, b. So somewhere between a and b, there lies a C such that if we go F of C, it equals Z. You know, this, this actually makes sense to me. So like if it's continuous, it has to get from A to B. And notice it can dip below, it can go above, right? It can dip below, it can go above, whatever. But it has to get from here to here. And it's continuous. It can't have any gaps in it. So in this case... If z 
Z has to fall somewhere on here. So that means C must be somewhere in here. Like they have to be connected to each other. And notice it's telling us, it's giving us an output. The output exists, therefore it has to have a matching input. That's the direction that this implication goes on the intermediate value theorem. So if I have a function, uh, g of x is uh, x cubed minus 3, let's say. And I want to figure out kind of like where there's going to be a, a 0. Like kind of guarantee myself an interval where there's going to be a 0. That means that um, if I can get make f of a negative and f of b positive, like here's my graph. So if I can say that f of a is down here and f of b is up here, in order to get from here to here, since this is continuous, it, it has to have a zero. So if I can get a range in here where I get a negative output and a positive output, I'm guaranteed at least one zero. It could happen more than once, right? It could dance around there a bunch of times and do it, but I know there's at least one. So if I take the inner the range, let's say um, the interval negative three to one. So what I'm saying is uh, a is negative three and b is one. And let me let me plug those in. So I plug in negative three for x squared, negative three squared minus three. That is uh, nine minus three is six. Well, that's positive. Let's see what happens when we plug in b then. Uh, 1 squared minus 3, that's negative. So it went the opposite way of what I thought it might do, but that's all right. Um, so this is positive, this is negative. So now notice what I have. Here's my argument. Um, f of b is negative 2. f of a is uh, 6. So that tells me 0 is between those two values and notice I'm starting with the outputs in this argument this is an outputs to input implication so 0 is between negative 2 and 6 on my outputs so I must have a 0 somewhere on this function and I know that it falls between x values of negative 3 and 1 right my output range gave me something about my input range now it can happen more than once like I said, it, this function could totally dance around like this, but it does have to happen at least once. All right, so here's another question. Uh, h of 3 equals 5, and h of 7 equals 10. Can we conclude then that there are no zeros between 3 and 7? So if I think about this graph, um, remember these are my outputs. So um, this is 5, this is 10, this is 3, this is 7. So I know it hits that point, and I know it hits this point. And it's continuous, right? So I know that anything between 5 and 10 will have something associated with it between 3 and 7. So can I conclude then that there's no zeros in this function in this interval right here? In other words, will it never will it never cross the x-axis? I think it feels like a yes, but the answer is no. We cannot make that conclusion. The only thing that we can say for certain is that anything between 5 and 10 as an output has an associated value between 3 and 7. That doesn't mean there's not extra stuff. Right? It, we can draw a continuous that comes down, goes back up, comes back down, and then gets there. All that, this, all that this guarantees us is if we know the output range, there's associated values within the input range, right? Like when I said it's output to input, that's the structure of this if statement. It doesn't go input to output. It goes the other direction. All right, well, enjoy the homework on continuity. You'll be identifying uh, different types of discontinuities, uh, finding some intervals for when things are continuous, and uh, don't forget to message me with questions or post them in the forum.